Hello, History 1 students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have notes for Chapter 10, Section 2, Republican Rule. And we're going to talk a little bit about what was happening in our Deep South uh, during the time of Reconstruction. And I kind of want to set the stage. You know, in, in 1870, um, by this year, all of our former Confederate states had re entered the Union. Uh, we did see that there were um, some other issues that had been taking place. Um, so in our first main idea, during the Reconstruction, many political changes did take place in the South. Southerners, particularly Democratic Party supporter, supporters, referred to Northern newcomers as carpetbaggers. Um, part of this was because of the fact that uh, as our Northerners moved South, uh, their luggage was basically a carpet bag. And not to say that all of our Northerners, uh, for the most part, were of goodwill. Uh, and number two, some of our Northern newcomers sought to take advantage of the war-torn region. Uh, in other words, to exploit, uh, to gain opportunity, perhaps maybe uh, to have an opportunity to um, build businesses or um, participate in government because of the fact that some of our former Confederates obviously still can run for uh, political office or hold political office or even vote. But others did come to find opportunity, and, and some of it was to help those people who were in need. And to talk a little bit more about what a carpetbagger is, I, I want to use a couple of these illustrations here. Uh, in our left illustration, this political cartoon, uh, you can see that we have our carpetbagger. He's got a a uh, piece of luggage that basically says carpet baggers going south. And if you look at his pack on his back, another carpet bag, uh, you see a little bit of his last name. He's coming from Wisconsin, going to Missouri. Um, for the most part, it, it, it's kind of painting carpet baggers, obviously, as, as kind of negative images. He kind of looks like he's a shyster, perhaps, maybe by the way he is uh, portrayed. In our other cartoon on the right-hand side, the man that's sitting on top with the saber in his hand is actually President Grant. And if you look kind of off into the distance, uh, you see what might look like the charred remains of an old plantation. And to the right side, you see um, another plantation. Kind of looks like a White House. Uh, around it, you have soldiers that are standing guard and you have tents. Uh, as you can see, you have... Um, a carpet bag that our president is riding upon. Uh, to his side, he has two soldiers, both carrying bayonets. Um, for the most part, one of them, uh, well, both of them have uh, chains that are linking to this woman. And on her apron, it says Solid South. In, in other words, this woman is representing the population of the South. And, and as you can see, she's walking on a bed of really sharp rocks or coals. Um, and in a sense, uh, the South is carrying in this cartoon, uh, basically the, the load, um, the turmoil that you know the the north has kind of placed upon them their backs and you can see inside of the the bag you can see all these bayonets and things of that nature in a way this is meant to to punish uh, our southerners for the war itself so number three white southerners who did work with republicans and supported the reconstruction had a nickname and they were known as scalawags and to the left here there's a picture of a guy named James Longstreet. Uh, just so you know, James Longstreet was probably better known as General Longstreet. He was one of the close disciples of Robert E. Lee. Matter of fact, uh, it was Longstreet, General Longstreet, who warned Robert E. Lee at the Battle of Gettysburg that the Pickett's Charge would have, was not necessarily a wise idea. Uh, but needless to say, when the war ends, he goes back to his home state of Louisiana. Being a former Confederate, he cannot participate in government, can't vote. Uh, but he did become a very vocal supporter of basically the Reconstruction and worked to, um, to help Republicans wherever he could. And as a result of that, he was pegged by his neighbors uh, as a scalawag. And he was really... Um, reviled by his his former confederates and he, his name was kind of slanderized for many years 
Um, even though he was kind of a, a Confederate hero, um, many Confederates put him under the bus before it was all said and done. Number four, at first, African-American leaders in the South came from a number of um, small number of those who had been educated before the war. Um, with the passage of the 15th Amendment, African-Americans are, are now having an opportunity to uh, participate in government. Uh, when we get to um, the time where our southern states are having to uh, basically go into a constitutional convention to, to get readmittance into the Union, many of the delegates were actually former slaves. Uh, when we talk about holding political power, uh, in number six, formerly enslaved people making political gains. Many Southerners claim that uh, Black Republicans ruled the South. That might be a little overblown. Um, you know, when we talk about the election of African Americans, a lot of it was more towards local level political offices like mayors, police chiefs, school commissioners. Um, we had a handful that were able to... Um, to gain seats in state legislatures, but very few actually made it to um, participating in the federal government. There were only 14 African-Americans that were ever elected to the House of Representatives during the time of the Reconstruction, and only two who were actually able to be elected to the U.S. Senate. And once the Reconstruction ends, many of those political gains are lost. Number six, graft. Uh, was a very common in the South, and it gave Democratic leaders another reason or another issue uh, that would help them regain power in the 1870s. And I want to talk a little bit about this. You're going to need a piece of scratch paper for this, but I want to talk about the good and the bad of Republican rule. And to to do this, maybe you need to find a, an extra sheet of paper or, or if you've got room in your margin, but I want to talk about some of the good things that happened. Uh, when the Republicans were ruling in parts of the South. And one, some of the good things were the fact that uh, many of these Republican governments repealed black codes that were uh, on the books. They established state hospitals, orphanages, uh, institutions for the mentally ill, schools for the deaf and the blind or the visually impaired. And finally, uh, uh, they established a public school system that still with us to this day. Uh, during the time of the Reconstruction with Republican rule, uh, we, see, uh, we saw the rebuilding of highways or roads, railways, and even the construction of more railroads uh, than prior to the Civil War and the construction of bridges. So all those are kind of good things, but there were some bad things going on as well. And part of that was how you're going to pay for it. Uh, many states had to borrow a large sum of money to pay for this, th these new items. Uh, they imposed very high taxes, property taxes. So in a way, it was to, to go after those people who um, were white landowners at this period of time. And then finally, the whole notion of uh, political corruption or graft. And, uh, you know, if you know anything about graft, that's um, basically illegally gaining um, power through politics through the use of money. In other words, uh, you pay for some of the offices or you pay, um, you know, t bribes to get things done. And all that was becoming very common during this period of time. All right, continuing on. Uh, your next main idea. During the Reconstruction, African Americans sought to establish their own thriving communities. Uh, the church had always been the center of African American communities. It, it was a gathering place, uh, hosted social events. In some cases, it was a school. Uh, it was a place to learn about politics. And all that continued during this period of time. Uh, number eight, once they were freed, many African Americans wanted to get an education. Um, a lot of that was done through the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, in 1870, there were roughly 4,000 schools in the South, about 9,000 teachers, and about half of those 9,000 teachers were uh, African Americans, former enslaved people. And they taught roughly 200,000 uh, youth and adults uh, that were formerly enslaved. Uh, so by the 1870s, we had a real comprehensive public education system. Um, for the most part, about 40% of all African-American children 
uh, by the middle of the 1860s or 1870s uh, were within some of the public schools. We also had the beginnings of the uh, building African American colleges. And so on number nine, gradually African American colleges opened, uh, such as Fisk University in the city of um, Nashville, Tennessee. You had Atlanta University and also Morehouse College, also in Atlanta, Georgia. But you also had others. And I'm going to flip to this bigger map here. Um, Probably one of the best known is, is kind of in the D.C. area, and that is Howard University, which on your map is number seven. Uh, Howard University was established in 1867, named after uh, General O.O. O. Howard, the man who uh, actually was placed in charge of the Freedmen's Bureau. He had been a Union soldier general during the Civil War, uh, and some of his supporters were Congregationalist um, and they helped fund the building of the school. Two years later, in 1869, uh, Howard University became the home of the first uh, school of law for African Americans. And it's kind of given, been given the nickname of the kind of the Harvard um, for black colleges. So it, it certainly is a very well-known institution here in the United States uh, with some very illustrious uh, alumni, uh, one being Thurgood Marshall, who was the um, first African-American to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court. All right, your next main idea. Some Southerners hated Black Republican governments and attempted to resist them. Uh, number 10, unable to strike openly, at the Republicans running in their states, some Southerners organized what we would call secret societies. And there were many of these, uh, but probably the most famous was the KKK or the Ku Klux Klan. And just so you kind of know that the, the name Ku Klux is actually a gr kind of a Greek uh, term. And if you throw in the word clan, it's, it kind of translate translates to circle of family. Uh, the Klan was established in 1866 uh, in the state of Tennessee by some former Confederate soldiers, and it kind of was supposed to be like a fraternal group, an opportunity for these former Confederate soldiers to come together and, and to have um, an opportunity to socialize, but it quickly went from being a fraternal group to a hate group, and that's where the problem lies here. Uh, their goals and the goals of a lot of secret societies were to drive out the carpetbaggers and to intimidate African-American voters and to regain um, power in government. So it would be more like what it was in the past. And so what ends up happening is our government is going to have to pass uh, a series of legislation. And, and this is kind of known as the Enforcement Acts. And here in a moment, we're going to take a look at the Enforcement Act. And then I've got a few other things I want to mention about the Klan. But uh, the third part of the Enforcement Act passed by Congress in 1870 and 1871 was known as the KKK Act or the Ku Klux Klan Act. And what you're going to need here is, a, again, another piece of scratch paper or, or some paper to write on, uh, you need to know these three parts of the Enforcement Act. Uh, the first part basically stated that it was a federal crime to interfere with the citizen's right to vote. In other words, if you try to uh, intimidate someone from voting, uh, then that is a federal crime and you can go to federal prison for that. Second part was that federal elections, that would be like your presidential elections or elections for um, members of Congress, are all put under the supervision of federal marshals. And part of that was to make sure that we had kind of a check on voter fraud. And then the final part, as we kind of mentioned before, uh, is known as the KKK Act. And what this legislation was gonna do was outlaw the activities of the Klan. Um, just so you understand, you know, a lot of our earlier members of the KKK um, were not necessarily, um, what I would consider to be lower class white people. Many of them were wealthy professionals, uh, probably former plantation owners in some cases. And uh, they wore the white robes or the robes in general and the hoods uh, to mask their identity. And not only did the Klan do this, but some other um, secret societies were doing these kind of things as well. But um, the goal here was to go out at night and break up 
political meetings or church meetings, burn down African-American churches, schools or homes, or, or to intimidate scalawags and carpetbaggers uh, who were helping African-Americans. Um, in some cases, they would do things by printing the names in the newspaper of those people that they wanted to target. And, and sometimes those would become known as the dead list or death list. Um, but needless to say, uh, when the act is passed, the KKK Act, uh, what ends up happening is the Klan, for the most part, um, for the most part, dies out. Uh, it's going to take, a, it's not necessarily going to eliminate hatred by any means, but um, for the most part, you're not going to hear much about the KKK uh, for a number of years. And it's really going to be um, around 1915 uh, when there's a movie called Birth of a Nation that comes out. And it's that movie that really gets uh, the interest uh, back in the KKK. Uh, the Klan from the early years did not do things like um, burnings of the cross and things of that nature. That's going to come later. Uh, and part of that was because of the movie Birth of a Nation, because there was a scene of a burning cross. And today that's kind of um, attributed to Klan activities. All right. Thank you very much.